Illinois just rigged its 2024 election, and the defenders of democracy, as they call themselves, the Democrat Party, are the ones who pulled the trigger here. Today we have the candidate, one of the candidates, that it might be affecting and will be affecting. We'll talk about that in a second. We're just going to go right into things. Dan Baer, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, give us a quick introduction. Uh, good afternoon, all. My name is Dr. Daniel Baer. Uh, I'm running for the 57th uh, district, uh, state of Illinois, as, re as state representative. Uh, and I um, uh, decided to become, uh, uh, to, to serve the state uh, based on a long career, long successful career, which is ongoing right now, uh, as it is, uh, but perhaps to give something back to the state and to the people, uh, given my expertise and sort of broad experience. So um, that's the short story, but that's, that's, my, that's the basic in introduction. There are actually three basic uh, uh, platform planks that I have, and the first is crime. Uh, crime in our area, 57th uh -huh. District, is way out of control. Um, the second is, uh, is that uh, taxes are extremely high, and all personally, my own taxes went up 50% since last year. Why is that? I want to know. And I have a PhD in applied economics. I'm not going to have any trouble in, in deciphering any kind, of a, uh, any kind of a budget, I can tell you that. Uh, and the third is uh, it's a matter of economic development and our ability to retain businesses uh, in a robust economy in the state of Illinois. So if you take a look at what has happened here, uh, one, of the, one of the metrics, a very good metric, is move-ins versus move-outs. And if you look at how many people are, look, look at the universe of people that are moving, uh, moving in and out, 65% of the people that are moving are moving out of the state of Illinois. And one would ask, well, where, where do you get your metrics? Where, uh, what's your source of information? Well, these are very good, uh, uh, good sources of, of information. Uh, one is uh, U-Haul, One Way Rentals. Another is United Van Lines, which does both commercial and does um, uh, personal moving. Uh, third is the, US, uh, the, the esteemed uh, U.S. Census Bureau. There's only one state that's wor that's, that comes even close to us, and that's California at 63%, and you know what shape they're in. So Not too great. I believe third place might be New Jersey and fourth place New York. That's so, I mean, these are... It's accurate, yeah. And then, you know, in that same general region, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey has the highest... Taxes, uh, property taxes. Oh uh, no, we we surpassed them. Oh, we do. Last, oh, we're last month, okay. we are right. number one. Okay. I got to get the uh, orange align eye foam finger that we can. Next okay. time in New Jersey, I can wave that around. Mm -hmm. So there but, you go. But we we all detect a pattern, do we not? We yes. all definitely do. I've known Dan now for a few months. Uh, he was introduced to me by somebody who was helping uh, find potential candidates. Uh, and so there are three ways to get on the ballot for a major, for, for major party in Illinois, and by major party, Democrat or Republican. And we, there are a lot of things with election law you can get into the intricacies with as far as um, third parties like the Green Party, the Libertarians, and so forth, and, and what their pathway is to be considered a major party. But um, the, the three ways to get on it in the general election is the Republican candidate. First one is the obvious, and it's the most preferred way to do it. It's the way you, you should, uh, there's no doubt. And it's to um, circulate your, your nominating petitions. Uh, right now, the, uh, the period, when I say right now, for the 2024 cycle, going into the 2024 cycle, the rules were this way. You'd start the day after Labor Day, and you could go all the way up to Thanksgiving week. It's a 90-day circulation period. and. Uh, our organization, the, the local township Republican organization and the other uh, uh, adjacent uh, organizations, we were out recruiting candidates. Um, we thought we had two or three different candidates at various points who were going to run in the 57th. And they were serious candidates. Things happen. And there are professional opportunities that arise that require attention. There's personal uh, things that, that occur. Someone... One of them wanted to move out of state, or moved out of state, so, which 
Incidentally, it was how we lost a candidate six years ago for the same district. We had a candidate got through the primary and she moved out of state. But um, that's the first way. And anyone can do it, whether it's with the party's blessing or not. So Joe Blow, who has every uh, position opposite the Republican Party, and there are people who are, who basically hold every position opposite the Republican Party who can get on the ballot. Arthur Jones, who ran in the 3rd Congressional District in 2018, um, he's a guy who shared nothing in common with the Republican Party other than we're all human beings, and, and I, I assume he's a human being, but he's also a Nazi. And he, he circulated petitions to get on the ballot. Um, so anyone can do it. The problem is it, it's sometimes a heavy lift. Like, why wouldn't you want to run? Well... Most people don't want to take the time off of work. Most people don't want to um, invest the the blood, sweat, and tears that is required to run, especially a race where you're challenging an incumbent. Um, and on the party side, we want to recruit smart, and we want to find people that will uh, promote good ideas, whether they're 100% my ideas or not. Um, they're people who, who will... You want an electable candidate. An electable candidate who can bring serious solutions to the mm-hmm. problems that we have in the state. So um, we, we found ourselves with three very strong prospects who indicated inclinations to run. And then as we got closer to the filing deadline, it became too late to insert a candidate. So Illinois election law going into 2024 provided two other avenues that we had. One is to have a write-in candidate. And I know a little bit about that. I was a write-in myself for a committee man the first time I ran in 2018. Nobody filed the paperwork to run in 2018. So I decided that there's a, it's better to have an elected committee man than an appointed one. And I won't get into that, but I went out and ran as a, as a write-in candidate. And that required me to get at least as many votes write-in as I would have had to get signatures to get on the ballot. So if you're running for state representative, no matter whether you're Democrat or Republican, no matter the district in Illinois, you need a minimum of 500 signatures to get on the ballot. If you run as a write-in, you need 500 write-in votes. Uh, There was a guy who ran as a write-in last cycle. His name was uh, Mike Clark. He ran in the 58th House District in Illinois. And uh, Michael Clark worked a lot of polling places, called a lot of friends. He got the 500 votes. So it can be done. Um, The third route is after the primary, if nobody was nominated because there was a, because nobody ran, the committeeman in Cook County and the county chairman outside of Cook County that the district covers will meet and they will vote on who the candidate should be. And we were working together. Now, in, in the case of, of Dr. Bear, there are uh, four people that would be consulted. One is Keith Brin, he's the Lake County chairman. It's a small part of the district, but uh, probably about 5% of the district. There's Kathy Penner. She's a Wheeling Township uh, Republican committeeman. She has a, a decent chair of the district. There's Julie Cho. She's the new chair township Republican committee woman. She has uh, a, you know, a larger than the Lake, the Lake County share, but probably smaller than Wheeling's share. And then I have more than 50% of the vote here in Northfield Township. So we... We talked and, and went over who we felt the, better, the best candidates were, and we all agreed that Dr. Bear was a good candidate. He was willing to run. He was willing to put his heart into it, not, not just you know, put a name on the ballot. And we all liked him. He was the best of the options. So we decided the earliest you can do it is after the primary and after we know all the polls have closed in the um, – in the district. Now, there was no write-in candidate, and there, there were no declared candidates, so we didn't have to wait for the, for the primary to be certified, so we, on election night, we had a, an event. So we had a bunch of people, more than 100, from Northfield, New Trier, and uh, Wheeling Township. It was a joint event at Hackney's on Lake in Glenview, which is in the 57th district, and at about 7.30 or so, we got up in, you know, on the microphones in front of the room and we held our um, they call it a representative committee meeting where we um, nominate and we vote and um, 
Dr. Bear was our choice. And he addressed the crowd there. He started to collect signatures. Um, and he, he worked diligently because you have to, once you're slated, you have to get the 500 signatures to get on the ballot. And let me say there's a fourth way, and that's if someone gets through the primary and withdraws. If someone does that, the committeemen meet like we did at Hackney's, and we name somebody, but that person's on the ballot. No signatures required. Uh, a few years ago, um, there's a woman from Highland Park, Cindy Massover. She ran in the primary, and there, I, I, there was a health issue with a member of her family, and so she decided it was best she didn't run. So I sat down with uh, Mark Shaw, who was the Lake County chairman at the time, and we nominated and slated Rick Lesser to replace him, to replace Cindy Massover. And so th those are the ways you get on the ballot in a major pr uh, party. Wednesday, when we were actually recording our podcast here Wednesday, mm -hmm. um, as soon as we're done recording, I look at my phone. Phone's blown up. So I, I talked to some people, and they informed me that Wednesday, Jay Hoffman, who's a representative from down in, in Metro East near St. Louis, he um, took a bill. It's called SB, Senate Bill 2412, and it was advanced through the Senate in May of 2023. And it has to do with the Department of Children Family Services and, and child welfare goals. And it addresses how they want to place kids in foster homes. It addresses funding requirements, a variety of things in DCFS. Um, important, an important bill. But it went through the Senate, and the House just put it on the shelf. So I'm not sure what they did with some of those issues, if they ever addressed them or they just decided it wasn't that important. But um, Representative Hoffman proposed in the House an amendment to this bill, and that amendment took out all the DCFS language and instead inserted election um, language. And one part of it is he put three advisory referenda on the ballot for November. Those have to be... That has to be made law six months before the general election. The general election is November 5th, so it had to be done by Sunday. So he put these three um, advisory referenda that are geared to try to drive Democratic turnout. But what's most important is that you're limited to three referenda on the ballot in any election. And um, Jeannie Ives' Parents Matter Coalition had been uh, circulating petitions for months over a parental consent Amend, uh, advisory referenda calling for a parental consent amendment to the Constitution, uh, stating that uh, children cannot be given any medical therapy, therapy medical treatments, or m medicines without parental consent. Um, that would drive Republican turnout. So the Democrats wanted to crowd that out. That's not a huge surprise. The way the law is written in Illinois, um, you could see that coming. It still stinks, but so they did that. The other thing they did, they amended the election code in Illinois. They made some changes. Um, one change is they, the petition circulation period for the primary starts now in August and will run to the end of October. So that means now if someone wants to commit to running, they got to commit uh, 15 months ahead of the general election. So that's good for political consultants. It's, it's good for career politicians. It's not good for people who are uh, want to be citizen legislators or people who want to um, take part in the process but have careers and families and don't, and, and don't want to commit because they don't know what their children are going to be up to in, in six months or they have an, an ill family member mm -hmm. or, or they have something ready to pop in, in their careers. Moving that, and it lengthens the period of, of a political campaign. And I've gotten feedback from people um, ad nauseum. Campaigns run too long. I'm tired of it by by Labor Day, and we've got three months to go. Yeah. I, I, so that that's the feedback I've heard. And what the Democrats are saying is we don't have enough campaigns. So, um, okay, fair enough. Uh, but but they. That takes effect in 2026. Another big change is they got rid of slating for state legislative races only, state House, state Senate only, and only when there's nobody on the primary ballot. So um, 
You can still slate if, there, if no one runs for Congress. So in uh, the 9th Congressional District, we uh, slated a guy named Seth Cohen. He's going to run against Jan Schakowsky in the fall. He's collecting signatures. We can continue to slate if nobody runs in the primary for Congress. Uh, there are judges. We can slate for uh, in the 10th Judicial Subcircuit. They actually changed the law to, uh, to accommodate that, I understand, several years ago, and we slated... Uh, Daniel McCarthy to run in the 10th sub-circuit. He needs to get 1,000 signatures. Um, we can slate for a county seat. So, for example, in McHenry County, no one ran for state's attorney on the Democratic side in the primary. Uh, the Republican a few weeks ago abruptly resigned and dropped out of the race for re-election. So the Democrats wanted, they, they think slating in that case is good. So that, that remains. But for state legislative races, and they may, they, they, the provision was this is to be made effective immediately. So this was Wednesday. This bill breezes through lickety split through through the House, and the Senate was planning on not uh, being in session on Friday. So that meant they were going to have to listen to it on May second. Um. So, and the governor would have to sign it by the fifth if these referenda are going to make it on the ballot. So all of a sudden. Um, Wednesday, when we stopped recording, I was thinking, you know, Daniel Bear is in great position right now. He had, it, we had in our office over 500 signatures, and um, there were some more out there. And that, w when the time came, we were going to be collecting them and, and putting them together. So instead, I get a call explaining what's what's happening. And uh, spent the rest of the evening traveling to people's houses to get last-minute safety signatures. And uh, the next day, we were meeting, and we decided that instead of waiting till Friday morning to file, we were going to try to do it Thursday. But we had to collect all these extra signatures. There were 500, I was told, that were out there. We were able to get another 170-something and get those bound. But the problem was I didn't get on the road to almost one third. I was... Um, in Chicago, uh, like near Irving Park and uh, Damon, approximately, and I uh, had to then go to Springfield, and getting through downtown Chicago probably cost me. I got down there after 4.30, so I couldn't file um, Thursday, unfortunately. Um, but I, And they closed early. Well, well, they closed at 4.30, mm -hmm. and the statute says the Board of Elections is supposed to stay open until 5 p.m., on the last day of filing. So was that the last day of filing? Turned out we had a staff member for the uh, House Republican organization, the uh, political arm. Mm -hmm. of the, he filed the paperwork Friday morning. And um, it was he, the uh, filing was finalized. It was entered into the system by the Board of Elections at 841. He was at the Board of Elections before 830. The governor filed the signed bill with the Secretary of State's office, probably up here in Chicago, because I don't think he was in Springfield, at 835. So now we've got another issue. If this goes into effect immediately, what time really did uh, Dan file? Should it count for Thursday before 5? Should it count for 841? Should it count for when the filing was initiated? I mean, the 841 is when the um, State Board of Elections logged the filing. Um, it's not necessarily, it, or it definitely wasn't when they handed the petitions over. And should the Board of Elections been open later on, on that Thursday? I think the other thing to, to question, this is a big thing, this might be bigger than anything, can you change a law while the election cycle's going? There, There's a standard in American case law, and I, you legal eagles out there, you can correct me. You feel free to, to correct me, but, and it should be a standard if, it, if you think it's not, um, that you operate under reliance of the law. So, therefore, Congress can't decide on March 30th that they're going to make the tax filing deadline and with no opportunity to ask for extensions available on March 31st. And now here you are thinking, oh, I've got two weeks to do it. I, you know, I don't have all my documents yet, but you know, next week and I'm planning on doing it. You can't do that anymore. That wouldn't pass constitutional muster. And 
I, I, I believe that there are going to be questions with that. Um, to make it worse, the, there are people who voted for this who are affected directly. Um, if you, you listen to the state um, uh, politicos and the um, people who cover the, the state legislature, they believe that it was designed to protect one lawmaker in particular. Her name's Katie Stewart. She's from Edwardsville, which is, again, near St. Louis, adjacent to Jay Hoffman's district. She's a Democrat. It's a toss-up district. I think Biden won it by 2% in 2020. Um, Bailey might have won it in 2022. I'm not sure. But it's a toss-up district for various reasons, and I'm not sure what those reasons are. Um, they, had, they couldn't get a candidate to run the primary. I think they had a similar situation where someone was going to run and then something happened and never happened. So they, they recruited Jay Keevan, who was a, a longtime police chief in Edwardsville, and he worked for the city of Edwardsville after that. Well-liked guy. Great candidate. Great candidate. Um, he had 300 signatures when this news came out on Wednesday. And his team like move mountains. They set up um, petition rallies on Thursday. During the day, they were knocking on doors late, last, minute, last minute Wednesday. Um, they had a couple groups that mobilized their people to come find pe uh, petition circulators and sign it. So they came up with 500 signatures in the last two days, is what I, what I understand. And they were able to drive it up from Edwardsville, which is like an hour, 10, hour, 20 minutes from Springfield, and they got that filed before three. So Jake even has, um, you know, I, there's no question he beat the governor's signing. Um, I tend to think that if they wanted to protect Katie Stewart so much, they will go to extra lengths to, to protect Katie Stewart. Dan filed at 841. I think he's a candidate. He's, the Board of Election recognizes him as a candidate on the ballot. And now we're going to wait to see what the next step is. I would imagine whatever happens, um, Every avenue, every legal um, option will be um, every legal stone, so to say, so, so to say, will be uh, overturned to look at where we can find um, or to basically make the Democrats prove that this is legal. So, his opponent, Tracy Katz Mule, she voted yes, and she. Um, of course she did. Yeah, we're, we're waiting for her to explain herself. She, um, interestingly, is, has only been in the General Assembly since January. Jonathan Carroll, who had a number of problems, resigned in early January. And you replace a vacancy the same way you replace a vacancy on the ballot that I explained. So it was a Democrat who resigned. So the Democrats from Wheeling, the Democratic committeeman from Wheeling, the Democratic committeewoman from Northfield Township, the Democratic committeeman from New Trier Township, and the Lake County chairman, chairwoman, uh, Lauren Beth Gash, they met at the Northbrook Library in January. And um, they appointed Tracy Katz Mule. I don't know how close the vote was, but uh, she had more than 50% of the vote. So it didn't matter if they voted for her or um, the man on the moon, she was going to sure. Springfield. Her her choice was going to be going to Springfield, and her choice happened to be herself. Um, she has been on the ballot five times that I could count, twice for school board, twice for committee woman, and once in the primary. She hasn't had an opponent. So, wow, so, that is pretty yeah, interesting, it's, it's eh? Very interesting. Um, so, you know, it, it, she, um, when she announced she was going to run in May, they were trying to... I think they were trying to coerce Jonathan Carroll not to run again, and he ultimately decided not to run again. But within three weeks of her running, she had um, amassed more than $200,000 in donations. And she had all the insiders were, you know, um, rubbing shoulders with her. Like, and, and she's definitely the insider's choice. Um, so I, I know people in this area, there, there are pe people who aren't, 100% thrilled with their um, tenure on the school board. There are people who aren't thrilled that um, she has been. She has spent a lot of her organization's money and her campaign money to endorse people like Kim Fox and uh, Clayton Harris III. 
Really? And she's also given up to uh, Re- Eric Reinhardt, who is the Lake County version of Kim Fox um, as well. But yeah, in 2020, uh, her organization endorsed Kim Fox for state's attorney in that primary. Mm-hmm. Um, in Maine Township, just to the south of us, that includes Park Ridge, they endorsed Bill Conway. As a result, the committee woman from Park Ridge, a state senator, Laura Murphy, who, by the way, Laura Murphy voted no. So if you're out there, Laura, or I shouldn't say Laura, you're Senator Murphy, um, thank you for, for doing the right thing. Uh, my disagreements with you aside. Her organization, Senator Murphy's organization in Maine Township endorsed Bill Conway. Senator Murphy was, I think, the secretary of the Cook County Central Democratic Committee. Okay. Tony Preckwinkle got her off of there. And who did she replace on the executive committee? She replaced her with uh, Tracy Katzmuel, who's now um, state representative, Tracy Katzmuel. Interesting. So um, I, I think that a, there, there could be vigorous debate on an issue such as education and crime. Um, should she have an opponent? Um, but... We will see how this shakes out. My opinion is they aren't going to be able to get him off on signatures, in, in my best judgment. Um, they're, they're going to, and, and that's because it, the, the number of signatures was lower than what I wanted. But we went through them, and we identified it's an extremely high percentage of high-quality signature or of, of registered voters mm-hmm. um, in the district. So... I think we're. I think they're going to have a hard time mounting a challenge that way. And now, when it comes to the law, um, I, I think there's. It'll be a, a a very difficult fight for them, both legally and politically. Um, Definitely, is Governor Pritzker going to want to defend this, especially as it picks up steam? I, I've seen it get picked up by some uh, more national outlets. In the last 24 hours. And I think it will continue to, definitely. And Pritzker, by signing it, this law had no transparency. Nobody knew what was going on. It went. By, it, it was passed with lightning speed. They knew that the, this Parents Matter uh, referendum w- was circulating. If they didn't know, I, I don't know where they've been, but they knew this was being circulated. Um, they could have passed this back in April. They could have passed this back in March. If they had a problem with slating, and there's a debate to be had about whether it's good or not, they they should have had this debate before the primary circulation period began. Yeah, as it's happening, or as it as it was happening, and um, instead they passed it and they made it immediately effective. I just all these things together, um, I can't believe that it would pass, I, I, especially in a country where we supposedly value the rule of law. I mean, I, and I do. And value free and fair elections. Free and fair elections. And, and you know, my party has, has, there have been times where I've kind of winced at things that um, have been done in the name of my party. Sure. And um, I think that process and, and due process and free and fair elections and and being able to rely on existing law uh, are important. I mean, when you start, when you have regimes that start changing laws as you go, and companies recognize that, and they they will classify that as um, I think it's sovereign risk, mm-hmm. and decline to invest in that country. So that's why you you really have to you you. Haiti, for example, might not get as much direct foreign investment as, say, a European, a Western European country in the European Union or mm-hmm. an American com- uh, mm-hmm. uh, an American company. Changing the rules like this, if you do this enough, people begin to back away, um, not knowing what they can expect. I mean, there's enough uncertainty in this in Illinois, um, and I, I think that. Um, it, it 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 just flabbergasts me that that such a thing's possible. So I, I've talked long enough. What's let your? Me, let me let me <clears throat> add something. I have a friend, a friend in Germany who, um, on behalf of the European Union, is engaged as an election observer, 
He goes to a number of different countries, sent to a number of different countries to observe elections. And he's discussed with me anecdotes of his experiences. Brilliant guy, um, uh, highly motivated, highly professional. He's also a uh, uh, negotiator, professional negotiator. And uh, I had a conversation with him about this, and he thinks to the mic here. he thinks he thinks that uh, these proceedings are really unconscionable, something that would have been flagged by the European Union. Um, and also, it, it, you know, consider. Uh, let's consider a matter closer to home in, in, in everybody's experience. Imagine if you had to file taxes predicated on a certain, certain regulations and you filed your taxes on, on a certain date, but those rules changed in the middle of the filing period. Wouldn't this be similar? Mm -hmm. Right, or, or if they say you have a... Um a tax credit for investing in this, or you, mm -hmm. you have a child tax credit for, for right. to pay for child care expenses or, or what have you. And so now you're budgeting for this, and you're planning on this, and then you do your taxes, and what you expected to be a light tax bill or maybe even a, a refund turns out to be a huge tax liability because they change the law mid-year. And they, they do make tax laws sometimes retroactive, which is very... Very controversial, but when they make a major change that people have already like have already sunk into, like okay, you're going to give me um, some type of tax incentive to do this, whether it's a company making a major investment or um, an individual. Maybe they they uh, um, do work on their home if there's some type of uh, environmental tax benefit or something like that. And they, they sink into it, and then they find out later, yeah, that was the law, but we've repealed it because it doesn't benefit us anymore. Yeah, yeah you, can't change, you can't change the rules of the game when you're still in the game. Right. Yeah, exactly. When, well, when you started it, the game. It, what, it, what I mean, it, it, madness. It, 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 no. that, that kind of thing. <laughs> Can you, have, how many times have you, how many countries have you done business in? Dozens. Dozens of countries. Seeing yeah. something like this, does this remind you of? Any countries in particular, or any <laughs> <laughs> countries not our friends? And, okay, right. That would suffice it to say that yes. Right. So I, I, I just, I, I, I'm just astonished. It's still just I, I, I'm astonished by this. And and the thing about it, there are, there are people running around. They're doing like m logical gymnastics that Simone Biles, Mary Lou Rhett, Nadia Comaneci could never dream of. <laughs> To justify this, including J.B. Pritzker, I mean, I can't imagine—I I can't imagine him how he can, with a straight face, call it an ethics law um, when it doesn't remove a lot of this anyway, and um, how he can how he can do that, and then um, yeah, it's, it, it's really a form of disenfranchisement when you think about it. It is it, for it, for a for a party that champions the cause of disenfran disenfranchisement and making sure that all voters are re fairly represented, all of a sudden, now, the 57th district doesn't have a representative. Uh, they don't have a second choice on the ballot. Is that right? Well, and, we got Soviet-style Tracy right, right yeah, now. It's not mean, okay. No, it's not. We have Soviet-style Tracy right now is what she thinks, and she may maybe she's going to watch this and welcome Tracy. It's <laughs> Good. We'll have a debate and, on it. But but um, maybe l finding it humorous. Um, mm -hmm. And you know what? Hey, you got me. You got me again. And uh, no, no, Dan, no, no, no. They attempted. What, what, well, they attempted. Right. But but I'm beside myself. It blew up my week. Mm -hmm. I wasn't planning on uh, making a 400 <laughs> <laughs> round, 400 mile round trip on Thursday. Yeah, I wasn't it was planning on doing a lot of this stuff. It was a fireball ride. <laughs> yeah, cannonball run down right. to Springfield. Mm -hmm. But. Um, so find it funny all you want, but the people you're really screwing are the voters of the district, and not just the people who um, would consider voting for, for Daniel Bear. And I, I think a majority of the voters would at least consider voting for Daniel Bear. Um, and if we had a, a full campaign, and, and we will, I think you'll get a majority voting for him. But you're also cheating the, the people who would vote for Tracy. I think there's something empowering about... Being able to consider two competing visions mm -hmm. and hearing people out 
and then going in and you're fired up and you vote for your candidate and say, you know, whether it's, I, I really love Tracy I, or I really don't like Dan Baer. And, and let me tell you, there aren't going to be a lot of people who say, boy, I dislike Dan Baer. Um, but it's empowering to go in and vote for your candidate over another candidate. Nobody it's, likes a blowout. No mm-hmm. one like. Well, 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 no one likes no competition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, it, it it safe to say. I mean, you, you have you, you're you're going to struggle to sell tickets to a inter squad scrimmage than to a game against the so called little sisters of the poor. Yeah. Uh, you want some type of uh, competition. You want to have some kind of vigorous debate on the issues because. Mm-hmm. It, it it makes the candidates better. It makes the candidates better. It makes um, it hones messages. It hones messages. It makes mm-hmm. the candidates accountable for what what they've done. So if they've done something that's ticked off their base, well, their base might come over and say, "Well, listen to uh, your opponent, even though your opponent's in a different party." That that happens all the time, and and it's a it, it's an interesting to see how people react to that threat. Um, and the second part about it is. The people who who are in the middle, who who voted for you the last time, they might say, you know what, you're too extreme. You've gone too far left or too far right, and we're seeing that a lot in, in politics today. Is that mm-hmm. guys with Clayton Harris, right? Well, no. We're, what we're just seeing in general, though, states are going so far to the right or so far to the left. And um, you know, I was talking to somebody today, and he mentioned there's a measure of of how a state's legislative matchup. Or, or makeup, how that legislative makeup compares to how the parties do on the ballot and the disparities that there, there could be. So he mentioned Hawaii is 90% Democratic in the legislature, but it, not a, it's not a red state, unfortunately, not yet. We got to send day. We'll send no, Tom Selleck back out no, to straighten him out. They'll, they'll wake up. Yeah. But, um, but, um, the, they, they definitely aren't 90% Democratic. So that, that's a big disparity. Here in Illinois, the General Assembly, 78 uh, Democrats, 40 Republicans. So that's a, a two-to-one divide. And uh, you know, generally speaking, Illinois, at its worst, is about a 42 to 43% Republican state versus 47 Democratic. Better years, it's much more purple. Than that yeah so it's closer than one might think outside be, be, at. you know be, between the gerrymandering which by the way in illinois is Awful. as bad if not worse than any other state in the union and hey i know republicans do it too i know it's it's egregious but come look here first take yeah, a look at it every here. single district pulls a little bit from chicago it's absolutely and, insane and mm-hmm. there have been there have been proposals for fair maps just for the state legislative races and they've shied away from that and so um, you know, Dr. Bear's district, if you see it, there, there's a map of, of the state, and it looks like um, it's green, and, and it looks like Gumby, because the head kind of goes up into Lincolnshire. It goes all the way up almost to Route 22, Half Day Road in Lincolnshire. Then it comes down, and it goes across all the way to Lake Michigan and all the way out into Wheeling. So that's about 10, 12 miles. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are the two arms. And then you have two legs. One leg comes down into East Glenview. And into uh, up to Lake Avenue along Waukegan Road. This is actually the 57th district, and it wraps around. There's a little I- inlet that goes into the 17th house district, and that's because Laura Fine's office is just on the road, and they have to be in the district. Mm-hmm. It's nice of them to accommodate that. But yeah, right. then the, there's the other leg, which goes down uh, west of 294 and east of Wolf Road, generally. I mean, it zigs and zags. So it's not. It's got several communities of interest, and it breaks up several communities of interest. I mean, Northbrook is not; it, they're in three different um, house districts. Uh, Glencoe's in two different house districts. Mount Prospect's in three or four different pro- house districts. Uh, Lincolnshire's in two different house districts. So you're splitting up these towns' clout. Mm-hmm. So while yes, you have two, con- you have two, you'd have two house members that have Lincolnshire in it. Lincolnshire's small to begin with. If there's a competing I- interest between Buffalo Grove and Lincolnshire and Northbrook and Lincolnshire, who are these two house candidates or two house members going to listen to? So, um, I mean, the, the, we really need some thoughtful 
reform of our electoral laws here in the state. And um, unfortunately, my party is not in control. Unfortunately, yes, my party probably blew it um, when they had a chance. Um, unfortunately, my party only had one chance. It's only ma- been in charge of the mapping process once, I think, um, since 1970. And that was 1990 when um, we won the tiebreaker um, between that because you had a Democratic controlled legislature and you had uh, Jim Edgar uh, as governor. And we, we actually won both the House and the Senate in 94 in the Contract with America year. And that was with a, a, a beneficial map. Ever since then, the Democrats have, have had control of the mapping process, and each time has been more egregious than the next. Um, that said, we, I think the 57th district is actually one that we can, we can make some noise in. If the, uh, you know, the Pollock Bureau member uh, including Tracy Katz Mall, and it is a Politburo, right? Um, allows there to be an election this year. Let me add. Um, let me add something to support your point, uh, TJ. And when I when I went out to uh, to get signatures, I and initially we didn't have a, uh, an army of volunteers, so it was really me initially. Right. And and when I first started out, sure. um, you know, full of drama like sideways rain and sideways snow, <laughs> sure. ballot petitions getting wet. So we could barely read them, that kind of a thing. But the, you know, this is all squared away. But I, I, I want to tell you that one of the things that when, when if Ian, uh, so let me relate to you anecdotally, that when I was, I, I'd have conversations. So this is one of the, uh, the, the benefits of going door to door and knocking on doors because you actually engage with the voter. You have a conversation. And they say what's on, some tell you what's on their mind, some don't, many do. And one of the things that I noticed that people who would declare themselves, you know, I'm a Democrat, but I believe in having a second candidate. I believe in having somebody else on the ballot. They told me that. And uh, I, you know, took that in, of course. I consider that. But, you know, that, that supports your point. And also uh, in, in, the, in the sort of broad, broader concept of free and fair elections, really have to. Why would you restrict? If you restricted a candidate from being on the ballot, what does that say for that party? Philosophically. Are yep. they philosophically aligned to what their stated goals are? I think not. Definitely not. Well, I think and the then, worst part of all of it is, is they're the ones, the mm-hmm. Democrat Party, are the people that are constantly saying, mm-hmm. you know, we care about democracy. Yep. We want free and fair equal elections. So the fact that they beat on that drum so hard well you know what for all that moaning all that crying look what we have look at that bill they're the ones maybe that's why they moan and cry so much is because they're the ones that are actually doing it and they want to hide it because that's like propaganda strategies you blame the other party for what you're doing i took some heat three years ago um (laughs) january 6th happened and we, we had a slate of township republicans running and I mean, I was disgusted by the images I saw. People, you know, defacing the Capitol building and and just, it, it wasn't, a, it, at best, you'd say it's not a good look. At worst, you're like, what is going on here? Um, and um, so we, we talked to the people on the slate and we released a statement. And it, you know, problem is when you have all these people together, a lot of things in there, we all don't agree on everything in it. Sure. But there's something in it that we said was like, uh, elections aren't perfect, but it's the best. You know, but but this election was the results were as they were, and I I truly believe that um, that Biden won the election based on what I saw and heard and understood. That said, there were a lot of irregularities. The way the election was run, partially due to COVID, and partially due to partially due to COVID, people really concerned about spreading COVID and, and worried about people who wouldn't come out to vote because of COVID, good good intentions, and the other people who were opportunistically jumping on this, you know, famously not letting the crisis go to waste, to change the election laws where it could uh, suit them. I think those two things together highlighted a lot of problems with the elections that we need to look at and we need to fix. And I think it, it there were races down ballot. Um, you know, there's a, a lawyer in Park Ridge. His name's Frank DeFranco. 
It's a good name. And it's a great name. <laughs> he he's he would give you the shirt off your back, no questions asked if you needed it. He doesn't care who you are. I mean, I'm I'm sure he'd give his shirt off his back to Patricia Fallon, who beat him by a hundred votes, and he doesn't have a whole lot of nice things to say about her. That's the kind of I mean, he's he's oh he's got a heart forty five times too big, um, but. There were so many irregularities, particularly with the counting of mail-in ballots, and um, I'm I'm convinced he likely received more valid votes. Sure, <laughs> we don't and, have to go and, into and, too much detail, but, but, but I, I agree. But, broadly but, but speaking. I'm saying that mm-hmm. there were, there were problems with the election that, that needed to be highlighted, and I think that this should be a bipartisan effort because I. Republicans want people to vote. They want people to vote. They want them to vote um, without too much trouble. But I do think it's sort of like I got my money in the bank. I want to be able to conveniently access my money when I need to. Uh-huh. Um, but I don't want it to be so easy that I get exactly. there and they say, oh, I thought it was you earlier. I mean, I, we, we see this with um, with instant credit and with uh, identity theft and with you know low standards where people – do report things to credit agencies where someone comes in, they don't even give a social security number. Yeah. Um, and and I want that to be, I want it to be harder for people to get those types of loans, especially when they're in cases of fraud. Um, and financial fraud, by the way, is an, another huge issue that I, I wish we'd see more governmental action on. But your vote is um, priceless. It, uh, it, yep. it it belongs to you. And if other people who aren't supposed to be voting are voting, it diminishes yours. It's like printing money. So I think we all could agree on that. And then the second thing is an election means nothing unless you have choices. If you don't have choices, why do you do it? We had a primary this cycle. The only contests were for, del- were for president, and everyone had dropped out by the time they got to Illinois, except for Trump, and delegates. And even yours truly, which, you know, I would tell people, go vote for me for delegate. I mean, it wasn't enough to get too many people out to vote. We had 3,000 Republicans come out and vote in the primary because there were no contests that mattered. Um, And that's just the way it was. And the Democratic side, there was one contest, I believe, that mattered up here, and that was the state's attorney's race. So if you don't have contests, what's the point of the election? It's sort of like Henry Ford's. I don't care what color car you want or (laughs) as long as it's black. Yeah. So... um, the election laws should favor the voter, and they should favor choices. I I don't disagree that there should be some kind of burden to get on the ballot, um, but not an unreasonable one. And um, and what they did was just, I, I what they're doing. What they're doing. And this isn't the only well, case they, we saw. Illinois that I mean, obviously everybody's seen what's going on with Donald Trump and how they've tried to get him off the ballot and. You know, at least but five different states, all of which that didn't go through. No, there's uh, some precedent. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. And uh, it's it's just real. It's sickening to see that it's it's so consistent across the board from the the Democrat Party to consistently try to throw wrenches in well, the race. I mean, though, it, the, just the whole thing about it. You think of it, they take a child welfare bill and they get rid of it and they, they replace it, and it's love DCFS goals. DCFS child welfare goals. If you go onto the General Assembly site and look for SB 2412, that's how it's slugged. I mean, that first is egregious transparency. And in my opinion, the fact that no, you know, it's why isn't any lawmaker saying, you know, I have constituents that you know, I don't know if they check and they care what the General Assembly do, but if they decide to take a look, we should make this searchable. Yeah. It, well, it, the whole thing just stinks to high heaven. And the other thing, it being made immediately. Few laws are made None. effective immediately unless some... there's a huge crisis or somebody mm. benefits. National, in this case, national emergency. In fa- this case, right. the crisis apparently is they, they are afraid that people like Mary Edley Allen, Tracy Katz Mool, and Katie Stewart are going to lose their jobs and that they obviously don't have much confidence in them being able to find new employment in, this, uh, in the state of Illinois. Although I think Katie Stewart could probably look in Missouri. <laughs> and Mary Adley Allen probably could look a little easier in Wisconsin without having to move. Um, those economies seem to be doing a little better, but anyway. 
So what? what get to uh, that point. Oh yeah. So I, I just wanted to, just a few examples. It's so. There was just, there's millions of memos. There's tons of articles of like, on January 1st, all of these laws go into effect. And that's because the way laws work is when they pass a law, it usually goes into effect on January 1st, 2024, or whatever that new year is. A whole slew of all, uh, laws become effective. Let me just give you a couple here. So on June 12th of 2023, uh, a law went into place to ban or officially ban banning of books so all books are allowed in schools which is something from the democrat party you'll often hear is oh my god they're banning books the republicans it's, are they don't want the children curating. to look at pornography it's, in the classroom oh my god it's curating books by uh, the yeah. way but yes go on yeah um but uh that law went into effect six months later in january of 2021 <laughs> Something that you'll hear is a, a crisis often. Uh, Illinois Paid Leave for All Workers Act. This one went, it got signed on January 10th of 2023, took a full year, January 1st, 2024, to go into effect. And that is providing a uh, minimum of 40 hours a week of paid leave, which if you, uh, depending on your thoughts on workers' rights, you might say, well, it's mandatory that that be in effect right away. How come this hasn't been in effect uh, even maybe six months uh, or three months. How about a full the, year. how about the Safety Act, which they they were saying is a social justice issue with uh, suspected criminals or, or arrest you know people under um, out on bail. Yeah, yeah. That it, it went to cashless bail and that it was unjust. So it was an, an unjust system, and they were able to extend it until it became effective um, January first of this year. And by the way, they they made. Change or January first of twenty twenty three. They made changes of it during the lame duck session because a lot of the problems they said during the election that didn't exist, they kind of existed. So yeah. and I, I there there are laws right now that that are in the general assembly that they are still deliberating about, which I think are more important than um, whether Tracy Katz Mole can can coast without having to run for office or run against someone. Um, and that includes, uh, there's a law uh, that they're considering about, um, it's like a statutory rape law. And I don't know if it, it, it'd be sexual assault or, or with how they're, they're terming it. But basically, a high school student who turns 18 and has sexual relations with her, his or her teacher, the teacher can be dismissed from their job, but they aren't, um, they, they don't necessarily get charged because the student is of age. But the problem with that is the teachers. There are cases of teachers who start grooming kids, yeah, to lead up to that time, and um, so they they're, they're they're writing the law. I, I think it's an interesting law. I think it's it, it it might be a very good law. But they're deliberating over it. They're not rushing it, and they're not moving as fast as some people would like. There are some laws on child. Was well, it just for if they're like a student at the school they teach at, or eighteen year olds broadly speaking? No, it's it's if you you've got a position of authority, so whether you're a boss or a teacher. So, in other um, cases, if someone starts to work at the Dunkin' Donuts when they're sixteen, and the creepy boss starts um, grooming her, and then when she turns eighteen and she's working for them, he's like, "All right, it's time." Yeah, and he obviously can lose his job over that, and should. And he, they could get sued for sexual harassment and so forth, but it's not considered statutory rape. But I think it, it's a, a teacher-student relationship or maybe a, a boss-employee uh, um, relationship up to a certain point. Okay. A, a kind of an anti-grooming law. And that's something that has wide support uh, across the aisle. Um, and there, there's, uh, I, I read that there's some anti-child trafficking laws that the Republicans are asking the, the uh, House to pick up the pace on it. And that's not a priority, but Soviet-style elections yeah. is is a priority. So I, I just don't see how any of this is good for for voters. And again, I you know, Democrats might think this is funny that I'm all worked up that um, oh this law is going to stand. They they hope the law stands. So uh, Dan Bear is just out of luck and so forth. Well, here's the here's the skinny on this. I mean. I'm furious about it. He'd be furious about it if, if it were to come to be that this law is good and will stand and, and his filing isn't valid. Rightfully I, so. I, I'm optimistic that he's going to be fine based on what I've seen. But 
They think they've got them. They think they've got the woman running up against Mary Edley Allen. They think they have all these people, and it's funny. It's great. It's it's just, you know, politics ain't beanbag. Well, yeah, you throw a fastball under my chin, knock me down, that's that's fair game. You knock Dan Bear out, who's trying to come in as, as a first-time politician after a long career um, in business and, and – um, advocating for um, infrastructure for in, in in both over the road and railways, trying to bring his expertise to the state. You know, that's all fair game. But what you're doing, this is not Bob Gibson throwing under Billy Williams' chin. This is Bob Gibson deciding to throw 100-mile-an-hour fastballs at fans sitting at Bush Stadium, Cardinal or Cub fans, yeah. not really caring. And, um, and, and, trying to get all the players they came to see get ejected from the game. So I hope they're proud of themselves, but this is this is insulting to um, Dude, the, the Illinois Amer- voters. In America hundreds, in of th- hundreds of thousands of voters in Illinois. It's insulting to all of them. And I, I, I want to hear the governor explain it. I want to hear Mary Adley Allen explain it. I want to see... Tracy Katz Mule explain it. And Katie Stewart, she had a written statement talking about how she doesn't like slating. And hey, let's have that debate. You know, I I think that the mechanism is is a good way to provide for a choice for candidates, but if they want to make that change effective 2026, I can live with it. I I already know of ways that I can work with that to to make sure we have candidates and good candidates but to do it in the middle of the election cycle it's like you know my son used to do that we played board games when he was three or four years old and he'd change the rules if he thought he was going to lose then he got older he got into kindergarten and, and understood a little bit about fair play and uh, stopped doing that but um you know may, maybe tracy katzman will be ready to grow into bigger and better things well, fr- frontal frontal lobes do evolve. Yes, they do. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was a worm in Bob Bobby Kennedy or RFK Jr.'s head. Did you see that? Yeah, that, I did. That ate that. part of his brain. So yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> let's uh, transition here, Dan. Let's give you a little bit of time to talk about a couple of things in the news cycle right now. I want to hear your opinion on. You could kind of spread your message and your thoughts on just. Here's just a couple of things from the news cycle this weekend. Crime is clearly a problem in Illinois, specifically in Chicago. So this past weekend, Chicago was forced to cancel their Cinco de Mayo parade due to gang violence. What are your thoughts on that and just crime in general in Chicago and your stance? You have to take a look at, if you were a policeman, if you were in the criminal justice system period but in particular uh, on the on the police force and you were told that you cannot pursue cr- criminals in the act witnessed in the act how how moral how demoralizing do you think that is how their, their motto is serve and protect why would they want to do that if they were going to be personally penalized let's say they were in pursuit of a uh, of a criminal who just they just witnessed uh, a crime being committed and they pursued him and there was some kind of a uh, there was an accident there was property damage and there was injury when the officers are held personally responsible how motivated do you think they will be to pursue on the basis of the law and on top of it when they know that if they're brought through the criminal, if the criminals are brought through the criminal justice system, meaning in front of a judge, and they're let go, with uh, with no consequences, and from a criminal's mind, a, cr- a criminal's perspective, would think, hey, crime pays, this works out, I'm okay. What, what's, what are they going to do? There have been uh, incidents, uh, anecdotal, uh, a- anecdotal recita- recitations to me by. Uh, people in law enforcement who have told me that they they brag the criminals, the the suspects, uh, brag to them saying, you know, I'll be out. Don't worry about it. I'll be out in 24 hours. And you know what? They're out in 24 I, hours. I've heard doing the same thing. I I've heard that, that, that chronic same story. Chronic where, where, madness. Where like what guy gets picked up for for 
selling drugs or mm-hmm. or a bunch of different uh, crimes like that. And they book them, they process them, and the police officer and, and him are almost on first name basis. Or one says, "Oh, hey Dale, I'll see you tomorrow. See you, Dale. see you here tomorrow," see, because he knows he's going to be picked up, processed, and released. Yeah. And when you talk about gang violence, I, I, I think we've talked about it before. We need to start treating it what as, as it is. When we start talking about call it gangs, you think, uh, oh, it's, you know, people still have in their mind might think these are like high school rascals. Sure. In, or, you know, it's, you know, they're, they're unsophisticated. This is organized crime. And it, it's not representative of the neighborhood. Although um, gangs or syndicates or however you want to refer to them, I think we need to refer to them as a, this, as a serious um, issue, um, they fill the vacuum left by both police and governmental neglect. Yep. So um, we, it, it, law enforcement, federal law enforcement, really has a role in there to break up the organized crime rings, the, the type of things they're bringing into the neighborhood, the, the kind of influence they bring in. And, um, and then the second part of it is we got to start stoking economic development and, and teaching people uh, economic, financial, and business literacy because it's not rocket science. But if people know they can make a, a, a buck and by going out on their own and, and um, serving their community in a, in a positive way. I, so the I, problem is that you have a culture. You have a, a street culture. The street culture doesn't really allow for that. Well, and, and this is this well, is what's a the street problem. culture? It's it's well, like it's partly could, driven by organized crime. Well, it's and organized crime, but it's also I mean you can get into the social reasons it, well, as, as to why it, that why dis- that's so distrust of the government, and that's, and it's it's not reasonable it's, distrust it, of the it, government. It's not the Ted Nugent you know mm-hmm. libertarian distrust of the government. It's you know distrust of police, which is driven by um, you know yeah. what are the the police aren't are so demoralized and have been for. In fairness, they've been more they've been demoralized against fighting some serious crimes. And so Yeah, they don't they can't get police officers. Police yeah. officers are going to Alabama or to the suburbs of uh, anywhere but Chicago. Or to Florida, where Ron DeSantis uh, uh, was paying them to come to. So that's they right. literally that's, pay that's, you money to right. come. Well But uh, bringing it back to our district yeah. here, this is this is this is and this is part of the platform. When you have women that are carjacked at Costco getting gas in Glenview. Or at, at Shermer, the BP station uh, at, at Shermer and Willow. You know, when they're being carjacked, this is this is out of control, and and so what has to happen? There have to be some consequences for people to act as a deterrent, and that goes hand in hand with the state's attorney's office, the the, the Cook County uh, pr- uh, prosecutor's office. You cannot just release people. This is madness. They, we're right, and, and well, they yeah. ba- basically some of these carjackings are done as part of an organized crime mm-hmm. uh, effort, and mm-hmm. they're using the cars to commit other crimes later. Whether oh yeah, they're, and and so Re- really quick, my cousin, this literally like four days ago, this weekend, he was at a car wash, and his car got stolen from him, and it's the only car they have. It's in Irving Park, only car the family has. They still haven't found the car. They still don't know who took it, and the police just said. It'll probably be found somewhere after committing another crime. And right. that's all they got. That's yeah. all they know. This, right. is a, this, this is the second person I know very close to me who's got a car stolen in Chicago. So, from so the people who are doing it tend to be lower-level criminals doing, doing the bidding of others. And are they going to talk? Why would you? Yeah. I well, mean, who's, 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 gonna, who's a bigger threat to your well-being? If you're a gang member um, and you're... you're Jacking a car, you're um, you're doing a smash and grab. You're you're uh, standing on the side of the street selling um, heroin or, or whatever it is that you're you're um, you're doing child trafficking. You're, you're you're doing some of the dirty work for the the, the syndicate. Who's gonna be, who's a bigger threat to your well being? The state's attorney in Cook County or your crime boss who finds out that you did say something and they let you go. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, you'd, rather, you'd rather be stuck in jail at, at that point. But so, I mean, I think this all goes hand in hand too. Is that we aren't doing anything to break up, uh, to 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 put 
the organized crime groups back on their heels a little bit. There has to be an integrated approach, and that's one of the things that I would initiate uh, as, um, as, as representative. Um, I know it's important in our community, and I also know through my uh, 517 knocking on, knockings on doors, uh, I have a pretty good idea of what people are interested in. Plus, I've had anecdotal conversations as well. Uh, just sort of uh, extemporaneous conversations. And so that is crime approaching it, but on an integ- integrated basis. Integrated meaning uh, 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 putting a number of resources together to, uh, to be a dissuader in our community, in our district. Don't come here. You come looking for trouble, you'll find it. And and quickly, too, the other thing before we move on, I think we should all point out that crime disproportionately affects, the victims are disproportionately poor and minorities and women. Um, the, they are disproportionately the victims of crime. And I, I don't know who the perpetrator, you know, I, I don't have a, a lot of data on who the perpetrators are, probably more male than female, I, I would bet pretty heavily on that. Otherwise, demographically, I don't know, and I don't really care. But turning a blind eye to it is not social justice. And, and trying to, you know, there are enough protections in our criminal code to, to protect criminals mm-hmm. or to, to give suspected criminals a fair trial. Um, I think that if you're looking for social justice, and social justice can mean a lot of things, I think you would want to be tough on crime. Now, you talk about people who are getting carjacked at, at the BP or people who are getting robbed at gunpoint. I guess a, a new trend is people are um, holding people, you know, h- holding guns to people and getting them to unlock their phones so they can then in- take their phones and use them to make some purchases, make phone calls or whatever they need, um, and pulling a gun on them. That's yeah, terrible. You have a gun pulled on you. You 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 get although, forcibly robbed. That is pretty that, smart from a criminal standpoint. Well, although, in the but, la- in the but last you think of the you think of the tr- the trauma someone deals with. They maybe it's not you know that that crime it doesn't rise to the level of being shot at, being raped. I mean the worst crimes you can think of. But there's a cost to that. Yeah. And some of this isn't being reported, too, because of it. And um, A lot of crime goes so, unreported, unfortunately. So Dan had something. You, you know, sure. and, and I'll talk. So, okay. A lot of us live here for a reason because there is, there is an impression, hopefully not an illusion, of safety. There is a confidence that the, the, these are safe areas. I had breakfast with a friend of mine uh, whom I used to be in business with. He told me that uh, there was uh, one of his friends was in Skokie Lagoons and he was jogging. Big buff guy works out, you know, kind of a kind of a badass. Sure. Uh, four guys came out of the bushes, immigrants, Venezuelan immigrants, held him up with Jesus. guns. And what was it? Two days ago, a woman was it yesterday or day before in Wilmette got oh. held up with a gun, and took jogging. her phone. Yeah. While jogging, while yeah, jogging. And they, yeah, I, I, that's, I, I read okay. that, and, and, mm-hmm. that, and they were saying this is happening more and more. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 I think um, safety is one of the base needs that you have. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it, and so... Um, Project that to property values, too. If you yeah. take a look at it, you can say you have a certain mm-hmm. confidence, you have an expectation. You come up here, you expect good schools, safety, not relative safety, you expect complete safety, that you can go out after dinner, and go and do a perambulation around the block, like me and my wife do. <laughs> yeah. And and we don't want to worry about, we don't want to be looking back of us and think that there's somebody slinking up behind us. That affects property values. And, there's a relationship And if you, definitely. Yeah. If you can't yeah. provide safety mm-hmm. in, you know, you, you definitely can't provide it in some areas right now. And, and the, the problem we have, uh, something stood out to me in 2022. Tony Preckwinkle was in, the Tribune for the, her endorsement meeting. The Tribune wrote about this. They asked her about the rise in crime in the suburbs, and she kind of laughed and said, well, I guess uh, those up in Barrington and Winnetka and Northbrook and wherever, they're, they're getting the medicine we're getting down in the in Englewood and Auburn Gresham and so forth. Yeah. And she kind we're, of chuckled we're not, and we're thought not, it was We're amusing. not interested in her prescription. But now, <laughs> now it, she found this yeah. amusing, and, and yeah. maybe, you know, she and Tracy Katzmuller are tight. Maybe they, they both find that amusing, but... Yeah. It's the opposite. 
it, it's bad there. It's it, yeah. it, we, we got to make there as safe as it should be here. Exactly. And why <laughs> tolerate it? It shouldn't be tolerated exactly. anywhere. Why and, tolerate it? It's a civil right. rights issue. Well, that, I think so. that's a broader cultural issue. Is tolerance in general? We can mm-hmm. feel we are overly tolerant of things where people think, oh, we have to be tolerant of that because of X, Y, and Z wait, reasons. Wait, wait, wait. What's tolerant? Yeah. Tolerant. Well, no, to- to- tolerance isn't a virtue, <laughs> yeah. for, well, uh, which is something you'll hear on the left all the time. Toler- oh, we're is, tolerant is it, it's, of this. It's, it's a default by acquiescence yes. is right. what it is. And, and, and so. it's become a cliche. I mean, you, 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 want, you, you, you don't want people to not tolerate immutable parts of people. And um, so, yes, you 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 want tolerate is is a is a low baseline for. Yeah. But when you talk about behavior, uh-huh. behavior, do you tolerate all behavior? Well, it's like that in like schools. It's it, the, actually there's a direct. I don't know about cor- it's directly reflected in the education system as it is in crime and actual society. Students in schools are getting away with a lot more things under the the virtue of tolerance. Oh, we're tolerant of this child. Never turning in their homework, they act out out of class. They're swearing at the teacher. Yeah. There's no discipline no, here. No, no, no. And that directly. No, no. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, and I, that directly yeah. reflects some of the crime policies. And it's, I mean, it's kind of like a pattern because when you're a child, you learn, okay, well, I can get away with X, Y, and Z. So now, now that I'm an adult, I've always been able to kind of do whatever, do whatever I want, mouth off, get away with things because there's never any consequences for my actions. So the culture spans from all aspects of public public buildings, pu- public life, that mm-hmm. kind of makes sense. Sure. hope I articulated that well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, it transgresses. It starts when you're young. Or start- so if we were tougher in schools, it would be tough. And we also, you know what I mean? It has to start at a young age in terms of tolerance. There has to be, in, in any kind of an academic environment, what has to be taught, as, 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 as my mother uh, taught my brother and I, one word that she... Uh, drilled into us is the word diligence. And so that became a sign of a kind of a, a, a core point on, uh, around which there was a certain discipline about getting things done, such as your homework. Well, that's part of a culture. Yeah. So, and when you have families that don't support that, what will the child think? Well, Where will the child exactly. go? And, and so it's, dil- a, de- it's a deeper problem. Diligence and perseverance, and, and right. it's not foreign. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not foreign to a lot of cultures, but you do. It, I find it very toxic when people say things like diligence, perseverance, punctuality. It was just a couple of years ago, someone was saying, "Oh yeah, that those are things that you see in white supremacist." Oh, you know, when everything was right, white supremacist. Yeah, and I'm thinking, just wait a second, showing up on I, time. I, yeah. I know. Come on. I know black and brown and marginalized people who. Um, see the value in doing their homework, in being prepared, in working hard, and not being knocked down for long. The problem with this is, in many cases, they were marginalized, <laughs> and they unmarginalized themselves. And yes, yeah, through using those strategies, right? And and you know, you, you know, people talk about pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, and you know, it's, it's, it, it, listen. You obviously, we're in a society where people help each other out and so forth. But a lot of people helps people who are helping themselves. And exactly, and you know, this is the thing I get with people when I say this candidate needs help. Well, they say, well, what has he done? What has she done? Are, are they good candidates? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? And sometimes they look and they say, well, this candidate isn't doing enough of this or that, and they aren't helping themselves. So I'm not going to put harder money after them. Mm-hmm. But this is something in, in case of, of Daniel Bear is I call people and I'm telling them, you got to start um, opening your checkbook because he's going to need some financial help soon. And he's already put his money where his mouth is. And he's already he's already been out there working and doing what he's supposed to be doing. Um, so, he, you know, things are an opportunity or they're not. And. Um, some people can say Illinois is a lost cause. I'm I, I'm out of here. I'm not I'm not doing it. But if you persevere, you can make something out of it. And you see this with mar- you know you you can be a marginalized person and and things aren't great. But if you persevere, if you do your your diligence and and you you you're prepared for what you do and you work hard and you try to be the best at doing what it is you're doing, 
you might find you're unmarginalizing, you're demarginalizing here's, yourself. Here's, here's, here's another way to look at it, is that <clears throat> one of the core problems that uh, people who are marginalized, it's, pro- it's, it's an issue of respect, and respect is earned. And if you, have, if, if you seek to get respect through violence or the thug life or something along those lines, eh, that's very superficial. Where you want to get uh, what, what you should strive for, what anyone should strive for is respect. But in order to have respect, you also have to have standards that reflect well, that, that, that goal. Well, in I other think, words, the standards have I, to be high enough. I you think cannot that's lower where, standards. I think that's where People schools come are failing, in, uh, that's especially right. in the no there's, a, there's an expectation. There, is an, uh, there, there are certain standards. You just have to be functional in certain areas. It's not a social question. It's a technical question. Do you know the math? Do you know how to read, write? Do you have a vocabulary? Do you know anything about sentence construction? Can you co- compose? Can you do a, a, a composition with, uh, uh, with an introduction, a body, and a conclusion? And if it's long enough, perhaps an executive summary? Well, okay, maybe for elementary school, that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's, that's a bit of a reach, but you should strive for that. And you do not want to lower standards. Okay, that goes hand in hand with respect. Respect by, you have to have a respect for the standards. But in order to have respect for the standards, you have to have standards that are, certain, yep. that, are that are high enough that are respectable to begin with. But, but I, I, I think what yeah. we, and to, maybe this yeah. is a good way to close it, is yeah. we see what kind of respect our lawmakers and our governor have mm-hmm. for the law and for those who are um, working within or within reliance of the law. So people look at that and they, you know, they see that people were out there trying to get on the ballot. People were out there trying to make a change Mm -hmm. and capriciously the legislature and the governor together puts an end to it because it doesn't benefit them. So people watching what, what is the lesson that they're getting? Um, They, what would they, <clears throat> a distillation of what you're saying is, do, would people respect this law if they knew more about it? And I posit that they would not. No, but but, not. but the law yeah. was written without any respect for the, for, for the current law. Yeah, well, right. that's why they wrote it under the guise of... Uh, what was yeah. it? DCFS. The DCFS, yeah. but an oh, entirely different context. Yeah, How does that work? Uh, Wait a minute. There was no <laughs> yeah. respect for the for the spirit of the law of the state of Illinois. Uh-huh. Right. Right. There, and there was no respect. It was a complete insult mm-hmm. to the voters in Illinois. Yeah. So yeah colloquially, exactly. it's a fast one. They pulled a fast one. Exactly. That's they it. Just, and the, There's they no just, other way to look at it. Yeah, and they just <laughs> did this at the federal level when they tried to pass what they called the border bill mm-hmm. when all the funding in that bill went to Ukraine, right. Israel, and Taiwan. It's so it's not hand. a border bill. That's mm-hmm. literally propaganda because it yeah. wasn't money for the... And it's the same thing here in Illinois. So I guess, I mean, at least right. they're consistently pulling the fast right. one on us. Right, well, but, but I, I think we need to demand better. I think that's the thing is we need to demand better. Um, you know, in the mid-'90s when the contract with America happened and there was a pretty much... It turned over the entire Congress quite, quite a bit. It went from being a pretty strong Democratic majority to a strong Republican majority... Mm-hmm. That people were referring to Congress as, well, what did Congress do to me today? Yeah. And, and I, I think we need to to um, make people aware of what's going on in the General Assembly. And these are not, it's not our best and brightest in the General Assembly. Absolutely it's, not. It's political hacks. And, and um, but yeah, maybe people, if people, we can get Dan Baer in there, we if can we can get, get Dan Baer in there, if we can get... Uh, Jay Keevan down in Edwardsville, if we can uh, get our other candidates uh, looked at, I mm-hmm. think we, I, I, I think they can bring something to the, the House of Representatives. So, yeah, and so the process is respected again. Yep. Exactly. Right? Yep. Uh, uh, Dan, any closing words, any, any final messages you want to maybe give off to folks at home, anything you want people to know well, about you? you know, <laughs> if you're free to take as little or as much time as you want to. I could, I could, um, I, I could wax on eloquently about a sort of a, a general philosophical direction, but let me let me say this: that we're we're talking about three major issues in our in our area, and that is crime. We have taxes that are unnecessarily high, and we're chasing business out. 
And when you chase business out, what happens? The infrastructure, or not the infrastructure, let's just say the tax burden, just the general tax burden, what, is that? what happens with that? That falls on the residents because business is not picking it up. Why? Because business is gone. This is a big deal. And so there's that. But then if we look forward in for a sort of a, a, a into the horizon, you know, the United States, the very values, the very things that made us a strong country are slipping away. Why? Because our standards in our mores, our standards, let's just go just broadly, standards are slipping and they're not being respected. Whatever standards we have are not even being respected, regardless of them diminishing. This is a problem. And I think that it is time that we bring back to this country, broadly speaking, I'll still pay attention, of course, to locally, but I think it's very important that we bring back to this country the very things that made us a strong country to begin with and reinforce those. I think that's important, especially in a geopolitical context. Such, such, so, can you give yeah. a couple real quick? I'm sorry. What? A, a couple of those values real quick? Sure. Um, educational values. Um, you must have high, edu- uh, high standards. People have to know the basics. The basics are reading, writing, arithmetic, what we used to call r- r- the three R, reading, writing, arithmetic. And you have to be competent in that. I, you know, it would be nice if you had cursive, uh, cursive back. Uh, there are all kinds of reasons for doing that, but you have to have basic math skills. You have to have communication skills, other than shorthand from texting. This is, you know, that's that's not com- that's not true communication. That doesn't build a vocab- vocabulary. And <clears throat> you have to have writing skills, so you're able to communicate effectively, communicate ideas. Uh, and, and generate more ideas. Once you read something, once you commit something to writing, assuming you can write well, you read it and you say, oh, wait a minute. I, no, no, no. Let me rewrite this. And every iteration you go through, you refine. That takes skill, but it develops minds. And this is crucially important. So language skills, oh, here's one more too, that we should do is, especially in elementary school, Kids' minds are malleable at that age. This is a perfect time for a second language. The English language is a, an amalgam of Greek, uh, Anglo-Saxon, and, and Latin. Um, <clears throat> it's often easier for someone who's not, who is a non-English speaker, to learn to speak English than for us to learn their language, just because of the, 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 the way our language is. But these are important skills that I think are neglected. They, I consider them basics. And so, you do speak a second language, correct? Well, I, when up till five years old, I spoke uh, Czech and Slovak. Okay. Uh, but and so I, I have a, co- a confession to make. You know, a scandalous con- confession, and that is every evening about ten thirty or eleven o'clock, I do Duolingo. Do you, know, okay. you know this app? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what I do is I relearn my, my check that I'd forgotten, but I haven't forgotten because deep in my head, there it is. And mm-hmm. I remember I can, I, oh, yes, I know this word. I've used this word yep, before. And I was just listening and, to you when we were setting up for the podcast. He was listening to a video in oh, Czech. It, it, no, no, uh, no, no, it was, it was in Russian. Russian. Well, yeah, in because Russian. It, it's a Balto-Slavic language, and so you can, there are certain cognates, certain words that, uh, you know, that are common it, to the languages. And, and at so. work, there there was a Ukrainian uh, mm-hmm. guy who worked there, and he could talk to the Polish uh, right. guy and and Ukrainian to Polish. It was very interesting to me. So yeah, so it's so that's it. I mean, I, it's sort of a, I know I realize I was a kind of a long uh, no, epilogue here, but that's, that's but uh, but uh, 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 these these are my beliefs, and these are all good virtuous qualities. Agreed. They're not bad things for people. They're good things for people. Why is it bad to have good things for people? It's not. Yeah, That's the exactly. message. Let's go. That's a great <laughs> message. And really quick, uh, mm-hmm. do you want to give us just a brief background? I know we kind of touched on like your background, like you in your professional career, what you've done, kind of. Well, because you're you're a doctor, but yeah, explain on that. I I, I did have a thirty-seven page resume, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it's never been accepted. So, um, uh, anyway. 
uh, okay, broadly, broadly speaking, I, I come from uh, a, a rail background. I started my career as a shareholder in what's called a short-line railroad. Okay. And, uh, and from there, it jumped into all kinds of things, from owning locomotives, uh, rebuilding them. I had a parts exporting business. Actually, I still have that. Uh, uh, you know, tran- uh, exporting locomotive components overseas. Uh, I have that. And, and then also a consultancy. Uh, where uh, we can call it broadly economic development. Uh, and my degree uh, is, uh, uh, I have a PhD in applied economics, and I applied that to how to, making, how to make railroads successful, commercially successful. Um, really, in, in, in this case, it was Europe, but really the, same, the basic principles are all over the world. And that's economic development. That has everything mm-hmm. to do with, and so these skills I can now bring, having had experience, I can bring that into the fold, so to speak, Got right? it. and uh, and apply that here and make contributions to the state, if I can get it. If he, if he needs assuming your help. I'm the go, I, go to be Bear, on the ballot though. <laughs> go to bearforillinois.com. Yep. He needs your he needs your help. Make a financial contribution if you can. Yep. Um, because he's. Going up against a very well-funded machine. Yep. So. And, uh, bear spelled B A E R. B E H R. B E H R. Like like Bravo the paint. Bravo Echo. Bra- Bravo Echo. Romeo. No, no, no. Bravo yeah. Echo Hotel Romeo. Yeah. Yeah. But bear like the paint, Got meaning it. I cover the issues. <laughs> what a way to close <laughs> off on things. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, Dan, yes. honestly, this is our second time meeting. Uh, listen to you speak when you were initially slated. Uh, I was at that event. Hacked. How much smoke yeah. was in the room? Because <laughs> <laughs> no no, Jamie Pritzker no, said it was done in uh, a smoke-filled room. Yeah. And, and remember, I was practicing that speech, yeah. and I threw it away. Yeah, he, I actually heard the speech before it was given, uh, so that was all legit. Uh, but just from the last two times speaking with you, you articulate yourself very well. I think Illinois would be lucky to have you, uh, and you're very much needed given our current condition in Illinois. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Red Beans Podcast. And we've podcast. got some, we've got fans. So thanks to all Maybe. those fans who chimed in. Yeah, yeah we we'll, pre- uh, love us or hate us. Uh, thanks for listening. My name is Beans. I'm TJ. And I'm um, Dr. Daniel T. Bear. Just call me Dan. Uh, Dr. Dan, you call me just, just Dan. And I'm grateful for the experience and grateful for the opportunity. Thanks to TJ. Uh, at, at all, but mostly TJ. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, you know, Dan Patlack and... Uh, right. Anyway, Kathy, Kathy, Kathy. Right. I'm really the whole. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity. I'm honored. I'm flattered. Awesome. So there All we, right, there we are. Thanks, everybody. Have a blessed so, day. Thanks. Goodbye.